Welcome, LA Progressive friends, family, readers, viewers. Dick and I are once again delighted <clears throat> to be speaking with Bill Blum, who is a former judge, death penalty defense attorney. He's the author of three legal thrillers that are published by Penguin Putnam. Um, and his nonfiction work has appeared in such publications as Crawdaddy Magazine, In These Times, The Nation, The Progressive, The LA Progressive, The ABA Journal, The Orange <laughs> County Register, San Francisco Mercury News, LA Times. Wow, the list just goes on and on, Bill. Welcome. Always good to be with you <laughs> on a slow news day. I know, I know. Okay, Dick, you want to go ahead? And yeah, so so uh, the reason we initially set this week's conversation up is you wrote a really interesting article about uh, attacks on marriage equality, principally by uh, Samuel Alito. Would you like to tell us what's going on there? Sure. This uh, came in a case called uh, Missouri Department of Corrections versus Finney. And it's a case that the U.S. Supreme Court declined to hear. And ordinarily, um, when the court declines to hear a case, it issues a one-sentence order saying petition for certiorari, which is the vehicle that's used to get a case before the Supreme Court in most instances, is denied. But Alito uh, wouldn't uh, leave it at that, and he issued a special statement, which is the functional equivalent of a dissenting opinion, uh, and he wanted to take up the case. The case involves jury selection. Uh, the plaintiff in the case is a um, corrections officer uh, employed in uh, Missouri, and she's a lesbian who the court documents say presents as masculine. So um, she alleged in a lawsuit that the department was discriminating against her based on sex based on sexual orientation and uh, this discrimination uh, arose after she began dating the ex-wife of a co-worker who then began to harass her pretty severely so at her trial her lawyer asked uh, prospective jurors whether they had um positions based on their religious faith against homosexuality. And two of them answered that according to the Bible and their religious convictions, homosexuality was a sin. So the court, the trial court, correctly dismissed those jurors for cause because those jurors could not be fair to the plaintiff. The plaintiff went on to win her case and was awarded $275,000 in damages. So then the uh, State uh, Department of Corrections appealed. The Missouri Court of Appeals denied the appeal, affirming the judgment. The Missouri Supreme Court refused to get involved in the case. And so the Department of Corrections petitioned the U.S. Supreme Court to get involved. Alito used the occasion of the petition to rail against same-sex marriage. He repeated claims that he made in the Obergefell case from 2015. That's the case where the court recognized the constitutional right to same-sex marriage. And he said essentially that the holding in Obergefell would lead to bigotry against people who hold uh, positions uh, on traditional marriage, who, who, who want to uphold traditional marriage. It's complete nonsense. It's subjective. It's emotional. He's very, very thin-skinned. But what he's doing is inviting the court to revisit Obergefell. And Obergefell, if you remember, was a 5-4 decision. And on, that, on the court today are three of the dissenters from that decision. You have Alito, you have Thomas, and you have Chief Justice John Roberts. And two of the um, majority, uh, actually there are only two from the majority who, who were left on that on the court today, Sotomayor and Elaine, Elena Kagan. So if the same-sex marriage decision came before the court again, its prospects are not very good. 
So I thought um, this is a good opportunity to warn people that after the Dobbs decision, which overturned the 49-year-old right to abortion, the 15-year-old right to the 159-year-old right to same-sex marriage is very vulnerable. And Justice Alito is just chomping at the bit to do away with it. And you can be sure that he has Thomas uh, by his side. John Roberts would would either have to repudiate his uh, dissent from Obergefell or go along with saying that Obergefell is no longer the law. If Obergefell is no longer the law, then what we'd be left with is the Protection of Marriage Act passed in 2022. This isn't exactly in the article, but I'll just elaborate. And what that uh, statute does, and it was uh, signed into law by Biden, is, is essentially require states to recognize same-sex marriages performed elsewhere. In, uh, if, if a state doesn't like same-sex marriage, um, which it now has to perform or provide for under Obergefell, it would at least have to recognize same-sex marriages performed in, in states that do recognize same-sex marriage. So what the right-wing Supreme Court justices appear to want to do is to treat same-sex marriage the same way that they treated abortion in Dobbs, which is to return the issue to the states, which would, in effect, destroy the right. And um, that's worth uh, raising alarm bells with uh, among people because the Supreme Court has arrogated to itself the job of um, dismantling constitutional rights. So the Supreme Court, in my view, is where constitutional rights today go to die, which ties in very nicely with what the court is doing in the Donald Trump cases today. And um, we can talk about that, too, this morning. Yeah, so so what's going on with uh, marriage equality is part of a, a broad-based uh, movement in state legislatures and in the Supreme Court to impose a certain blinkered view of what the Bible, the Christian Bible tells, says, uh, uh, governs behavior. And it's in a way to impose a, a, a kind of Christian morality on, on the country, which, which really the Constitution is supposed to protect us from. Isn't that right? That's right. The court is creating this new heightened interest in what it calls religious liberty. Now, the First Amendment protects freedom of worship, and it protects against the establishment of religion. But under the leadership of people like Alito and uh, Thomas, the court is elevating what it calls religious liberty above all other rights. And you can see this from the Hobby Lobby case forward, the Hobby Lobby case being uh, that case which said, religious uh, corporations or corporations with closely held religious beliefs don't have to provide for contraception care in the health insurance plans that they offer to their employees. So this is a very dangerous process and it's part of the uh, remaking of America as a pro-corporate Christian theocracy. And that sounds kind of extreme, but that is, I believe, what's happening in the United States today. And it's very important for people to become aware of that so that they can uh, gear up to fight that, that, uh, that tidal wave that, that's upon us right now. So um, I certainly believe that I believe strongly in the separation of church and state. But um, as a Christian, I take exception of characterizing what they're doing as calling it Christian, because one of the primary edicts of the Christian Bible is to care for the poor, is to care for foreigners. And they've been very selective about what they feel is most important and most important to put out as a Christian value. They've been highly selective. And we can tell by the way that um, the court has ruled on favoring corporations favoring the wealthy, uh, favoring the deep-pocketed. It's quite easy. I'm not a biblical scholar, 
But I think it would be easy to make the case that all of those ways that they have ruled are anti-Christian. So, um, correct. Yeah. You know, and then you look at what the Alabama Supreme Court did recently with its IVF ruling, which cited the Dobbs decision, I think, uh, 14 or 15 times. And now that court, unless their legislature radically alters their statutes, is regarding embryos as fully uh, formed people uh, for purposes for, for legal purposes. And this flies in the face of science as well as um, equal treatment for ordinary Americans. So this is what's been unleashed by the Supreme Court. And uh, again, it's really important to recognize what's going on so that we can fight against it effectively. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the recent uh, decision for the Supreme. The Supreme Court has delayed hearing arguments, um, and some some say that this delaying is going to put um, Donald Trump in a better position. You want you want to talk about this decision that just came out? Was it yesterday yeah. or, or yesterday? This is a very sad and pathetic capitulation to the needs and interests of Donald Trump. Back in 2018, there was this public debate between John Roberts and Donald Trump over whether there are Trump judges and Obama judges and whether they rule differently. And of course, John Roberts said, that's nonsense. Judges adhere to the law. Well, judges adhere to the law only to the extent that it helps the uh, Republican Party on the Supreme Court. That's the bottom line. And what happened here in the Jack Smith election subversion case is that Trump is raising the issue of presidential immunity and not just qualified immunity, but absolute immunity from criminal prosecution for any official acts that he uh, committed while he was president. So not only while he's sit a sitting president, could he not be prosecuted? But even afterwards, when he's a former president, he could not be prosecuted. And he wants absolute immunity. And of course, in his view, everything that he does is an official act. And it gets a little more complicated than that. If you want to get into the weeds, the Trump lawyers want um, the civil immunity standard that the court established long ago in a case called Fitzgerald versus Nixon, uh, which said that the president should be immune from civil damages actions for uh, acts undertaken within the outer perimeter of his official duties. And they want to make that standard apply to criminal law. That's never been the law in the United States. It's contrary to United States versus Nixon. And it's contrary even to recent pronouncements of this Supreme Court. But um, after the District uh, of Columbia Court of Appeals ruled that Trump does not have absolute immunity, the uh, Supreme Court could have just accepted that decision and said, now we're returning the case to the trial judge, Judge Chutkin in Washington, D.C., so that the election subversion case can go to trial. But instead of doing that, the court took weeks and weeks and weeks to make a decision to hear the case. And then instead of hearing it immediately, it said oral argument for April 22nd, which means that in all likelihood, the court will not issue a ruling until the end of its term at the end of June which means that the case will then go back to the Court of Appeals, which will hopefully then return it to Judge Chutkin. But I don't think that that will be enough time to enable her to set the case for trial before the election. And that's been Trump's game plan all along. His game plan is not to beat these cases on the merits because these are very strong cases. This case, the case from Georgia, 
and the and Mar-a-Lago documents case, his, his plan is to delay these cases until he's president again. And if he's president again, he can just dismiss the federal cases and he can use the power of the federal government under the supremacy clause to call a halt to pressure the Georgia case to be postponed until he is out of office, if indeed he ever leaves office again. So this is the game plan, and we have a Supreme Court, which is effectively de facto offering him immunity, even if on the merits, when they eventually get around to making a merits decision, they rule against it, which I still think they will because the case is so absolutely weak. But here's the biggest irony. Suppose that Trump is reelected and the court issues a decision saying the president, former presidents do not enjoy absolute immunity for acts undertaken while they were president. Well, who would be the ex-president then? It would be Joe Biden. And Joe Biden would then be fair game under the court's most recent pronouncement on an absolute immunity, which would set Biden up for prosecution. So this is a very distressing development. And I don't see how we avoid this now, given the schedule that the court has set. So, uh, you know, Chuck can would have, she has to give the Trump people time to complete discovery in order to comport with due process. So even if she receives the case in early July, the earliest that she could set the case for trial would be September, maybe late September, early October, but that runs right into the election. And the question then is whether or not she should set it. There is a Department of Justice policy against undertaking investigations which would interfere with elections. The Justice Department has recently said in the Mar-a-Lago case that doesn't apply to indictments which have already been returned into the setting of trials. But who knows what would happen and I'm very pessimistic, as I think the great uh, weight of commentators on this question have uh, indicated that the trial will go forward before the election, which means that the only case that's going to go forward before the election, it now appears, is Alvin Bragg's case, the hush money case against Trump, which is set for trial in Manhattan on March 25th. Yeah. So there yeah. we are. Yeah. Yeah. So well, so where we are is is a, is a pretty as you said in a, with a number of adjectives a, a very dis, de, depressing distressing. Um, it, it appears that Trump Trump's game plan is actually going to work. The only the only remedy is is if he doesn't win re-election, which that's is, right. Who, who knows? What, one of the going. one of the big takeaways here is that. We, the American people, cannot rely on the U.S. justice system to save us from Trumpian fascism. It's just not going to happen. We have to save ourselves. That's the bottom line here. Absolutely. Yeah. And, yeah, and, and I would like to say that what Trump has done, especially as it relates to the justice system, is shine a really big light on the many ways that there is just injustice in our justice system. And it appears that the justice system is really only applies to certain people. Other people can just uh, do what they want. And Trump is a perfect example of that. And I have a, a strong feeling that this happens more often than we realize, but because wherever Trump shows up, there's media, he's really putting a spotlight on the flaws within the justice system. I agree with you. I agree completely. It, Trump has gotten hyper due process. The mm -hmm. the average criminal defendant would would have been tried, would have been convicted, would have probably been sentenced to prison by now. Yeah. But I will say, I mean, you know, I I, I dread the fact that uh, Trump would ever be president again. But I also know we know about January sixth. He plainly lost an election, and yet he has fought it tooth and nail, and and has. 30 or 40% of the country believing him. 
if he were uh, uh, prevented from taking office by a legal case, no matter how strong it was, no matter how many justices ruled in favor of it, I think the country would be torn asunder, Yeah, honestly. Well, I think that the country is going to be torn asunder regardless of whether he wins or whether he doesn't win. Well, but keep in mind, though, the election subversion case is, is not per se designed to keep him off the ballot. It's designed to give the American people the opportunity to see what he did in right. detail on January 6th and then to make a decision as to whether or not they want to elect him. The case that could disqualify him from the ballot is the one from Colorado, which we're waiting for. We're, we're waiting for a decision from the Supreme Court, but it appears certain that uh, they're going to keep him on the ballot. So again, this is a court to get back to 2018. I think this is uh, th this perfectly illustrates that there are Trump judges and there are many of them sitting on the Supreme Court today. Yeah. Well, Bill Blum, thank you for joining us. It's been another enlightening half hour with Bill Blum. That's what we should call this series. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I hate to be Debbie Downer, but uh, I have to tell it like it is, too. That's right. That's yeah, right. but it's wonderful. You you apply all your, your your experience as a longtime lawyer and a judge and a professor and a, and a scholar and a writer. Uh, I, I'm glad that Pete, you and people like you are, are are keeping the public up to date about what's really going on. Yeah, because we're in we're in a, a crisis, a, a political crisis as big as anything in my long lifetime. I would say. Yeah, I agree. Well, and I'm really happy for you for what you do uh, and all the effort that you make to to bring progressive points of view to a, a wide audience. And I'm happy to do anything I can to widen that audience. We appreciate that, Bill. So we welcome you every time and look forward to seeing and talking to you again in the very near future. Yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. So All right. Thanks. Thank you for sticking around. If you like the LA Progressive content and the discussions we have here, please consider clicking the subscribe button below and also give us a thumbs up. That helps to grow our audience by feeding the algorithm, which helps to get this content in front of more eyes. Thanks for stopping by. We really appreciate your support.